Ben, do you have that PowerPoint? Yeah, that's what's up. So we had to use like 14 different PowerPoints before we found one that actually showed up. So it's not we're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at the the idea. Do people really change? See, we like to have this kind of idea. And most of us, if we're honest, other people don't change, but I change, right? I'm not hopeless. Everybody else is hopeless. Well, you know, I, I hear a lot of people on both sides of this. You know, on one side, you hear, I, I've actually heard pastors say people don't really change. And I've also heard pastors say people do change. Well, they can't both be right. Either people do change or people don't change. So I don't want you to stone me, okay? Just listen to what I have to say before you get angry. Do people really change? Go to that first point there, Benny. No, people don't change. Now, hold on. Don't get mad yet. Hold on. Let me explain, okay? You see people in addiction, and even if they do get out of addiction, they go. Just, they just go to another addiction. You know what I mean? They, they, they stay in that. They don't learn self-control. They just learn to redirect it. You see people no longer doing, you know, meth, but now they're overeating. It's like, well, so you just changed your addiction. You've got, now granted, one is, you know, meth and one is eating, but still it's the same. You see what I'm saying? The, they haven't really changed. You know, you got the same patterns with the same results. You, well, I've lived in depression my whole life, and now I'm saved, and I'm still living in depression. You know, you got, oh, well, you know. Look at society itself. Society stands, stays the same, which is just another point that people don't really change. So that brings me to the second more important question. Does God change people? Ah, now there's a better question. Because the question, do people change, it's kind of, it's fluid. It's not really, it's not really an answer that can be given. You know, there is no right answer to that question. It, you're asking something that's too broad. Do people change if what? If they have a spiritual encounter, if they don't? If they live in a bubble or if they live in society? Like, what are you specifically asking? But now we've got a question that we can actually answer. Go to the next point there, buddy. Does God change people? Yes. Yes. People are not doomed to live the same way year after year. There is a miracle worker, and that's exactly my point. When people change, this is a miracle. And see, the thing is, is those of us who God has changed, we like to take it for granted. Well, I changed. You can too. God changed you. Remember that next time you get angry with someone who's not changing quick enough for you. God did the work. You didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a pretty good person. Even God's going to be in awe of how good of a person I am. That didn't happen. God patiently worked with you throughout the years. That's what happened. So, you know, that, that, that seems like a little bit more of a focus question. That brings us to a third closely related question. Do people always let God change them? Ooh, now we now we're now we're getting to a very un, uncomfortable question, because the answer is no. I've seen people who've been in church their whole life, but can't keep their mouth shut. They just can't. They just can't. I mean, they don't even want to. They don't think that they're wrong anyways, because they're the righteous one. Everybody else is wrong. So then you tell them, hey, maybe you should learn to you know not say so many things. Well. That you're just wrong. It's like, well, okay. All right. But then we also see the same thing happen with people who just come into the church, people who didn't haven't been in it forever, just people who, you know, maybe have been saved for a year or two, you know, where they hold on to something. Surely you've never done that, right? Holding on to something. Surely you would never have done that. But for real people like me, yes, yes, we do do that. Um, so that brings us kind of to this idea. We need to excel spiritually. We need to, we need to grow spiritually so that we can allow God to change us. So what we really need in all this is if we could figure out some way to tell the future, if we could figure out some way to look into tomorrow and say, am I the kind of person who's going to be letting God change me? 
Well, I know this kind of seems like I'm just kind of spinning around in circles, but here's my, here's my main point. Let me think of a different way to say my main point. We can know if we're going to fall away in five or ten years. We can know if we're going to abandon the faith. There are flags that the, spirit, that, the, the, that the Bible warns us of. And if we pay attention, we can look and see if they are coming up in our lives. Does that kind of make sense? So from the process of seeing many people fall away and many people not fall away, I have started to notice these things. And I have formed a list of things that are evident in us that should warn us that we are no longer changing, but we're getting ready to backslide. And what I mean by backslide is abandon the faith. So without further ado, let's go to the first one. Refusing to listen. In St. Timothy 4.23, he has something in here that, you know, I don't hear, I, I don't really hear like this much. Let me kind of, well, I'll come back to that. Hold on. In St. Timothy chapter 4, verse 23, it says this. Are you on that? Yeah. Um, no, it can't be chapter four. Where am I here? Two to three. Sorry, two to three. I knew that was wrong. Uh, okay, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Okay, did you hear what he just said? Now, this kind of a letter is a letter that Paul wrote to the pastor of the church. In this case, it was Timothy. And these kinds of letters were meant to be read out loud to the congregation after the person who it was written to had read it. In other words, Timothy had poured over it, now he's reading it to his congregation. And so this is the way of looking at what my point is. In verse two it says, reprove, rebuke and exhort. See, we're okay with pastors encouraging us, we're okay with people giving us things that make us feel good, but then when there's something in us that need to change, the wall goes up. Boom. This is the worst pastor in the world, this is the worst, worst church, they all hate me and I hate all of them. You see what I mean? Instantly the walls go up. When that's ex So let me, let me say what Paul is saying here. Get ready for Timothy to preach the word to you because I told him to. He's going to be ready in and season out of season because that's what I just told him to do. So you be ready for him to reprove you and rebuke you and exhort you so that you can grow. Why do I need to be rebuked? Well, besides, the, well, I'll get to that in a second, but, um, but also it tells Timothy to be patient while he's doing this because people don't change overnight. See, that's what people mean a lot of the times when they say people don't really change. They mean they don't change as fast as I would like them to change. So you mean to tell me that you followed this person around for their entire span from birth until whenever they will die, and you are ready to tell me, based on conclusive evidence, that people do not change? So I mean, like, that's a little bit of a leap. <laughs> that's a little bit of a leap. You've known them, like, what, five years, and they haven't changed as fast as you want? Well... So the first little mark that you can pay attention to in your spirit is when you start to refuse to listen. When you can't be told anything. You know everything. You're as spiritual as they come. Nobody else has got anything on you. And real close to that, you hear people say, don't judge me. Well, besides what I just said, Galatians actually said something, um, says something that, that I found humorous. So I'm gonna read it to you so that you cannot laugh and all feel awkward. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16 says, So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? How many times has that happened where, where somebody tells you something that you needed to hear and they become your, your enemy? And I'm not talking about when people nitpick. And you shouldn't nitpick people. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about where somebody goes up to you and says, Look, I've noticed that there's kind of a negative change that's happening here. I, I've been praying for you, and I, and I really think that you know you might want to pay attention to this. You see what I mean? That's what I'm talking about. When you go to a friend and support them versus you're just being critical. Big difference. 
Okay, so the second thing, go to the next point there, buddy. Thinking you're better than someone else. This is a big sign that you can guarantee is showing that you're getting ready to fall away. When you think that you're better than everybody else. In Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, it says this. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one Pharisee and the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Thank you that I can so adequately fulfill the law and be so perfect. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Wow, that's a statement and a half. So the second, the second sign of you're getting ready to fall away when you think you're better than someone else. The third sign is very close. Go ahead and go to the third point there, buddy. I don't need help. They do. I think, you know, we should have ministries in the church for them, all those sinners out there. I don't need help. I've got this. Where you can see that they're clearly in a jam. They're clearly in a situation where they need God. They need the church. They, they need... No, I got this. I'm self-sustaining. You look in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. It says something very, very um, important about this. Jesus is, telling, is preaching what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the Beatitudes. It's in Matthew 5. But anyways, in verse 6 it says, uh, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst... For righteousness. Have you ever had the munchies? I mean, you're just, you're, you're working yourself up to a sweat thinking about that. Oh, I really want beef jerky. Oh, boy. And your tongue starts doing that thing. You know, the, you know the thing that your tongue does where you get spit on, this, on, on the side of your tongue and it's like, it, it's, like it, it, it's like it adds extra flavor to your mouth. And you're ready to consume it. You're, you're just waiting for the day that you will bite into that beef jerky or whatever you know, for Randy, it would probably be, uh, uh, you know, nuts. He likes, you know, and, you, know, and you know, remember, he doesn't like, he doesn't like candy. Remember that. You know, he doesn't like sweets. He doesn't like sweets. Just peanuts and pecans and that kind of stuff, you know. Ice cream. And ice cream. And he sometimes ice cream with the nuts in it. Ah! Pistachio almond ice cream. Oh, boy. Now, now my mouth really is watering, guys. Okay. So we're talking about that in, in, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. They're going to get what they want. You know, when I'm in town and I want McDonald's fries, I go to McDonald's and I order fries and they give it to me. I get what I want. When God sees people who are seeking him, they, they, just, they just want more. He's going to give it to them. But you don't have to wait in that retarded dual lane. <laughs> Anyways, I think they tried to, when you try to fix something that's not broken and just make it worse. Anyways, um, this help, I, this, this idea of I don't need help, they may, they may need it, but I don't. I'm old enough to know. I'm mature enough to know. I'm, uh, I'm man enough. Strong enough. I'm good enough. I've got enough money. I don't, don't need it. Very, very bad attitude to have because here's the thing. God always rewards those who are actually wanting from him. And for those who don't want, guess what they're not going to get? That's simple. If you don't ask for it, he's not going to give it to you. Okay, you, you think you can do it on your own? Okay, go ahead, but I'm here whenever you're ready to come to your senses. You know, so that brings us to our, to our fourth point here, self-centered. And you know, the thing is, being self-centered is a big cause of depression and anxiety. Do you know, there's actually a very small amount of people who have something physically wrong with their brain. Most of them are doing something stupid, and then they have depression and anxiety, so then they need meds. Because did you know that the longer you have depression and anxiety, the more it changes your brain functions? So in other words, let me put something to let me put this to you. Okay, you have a perfectly healthy brain. You do something stupid that makes you depressed. You don't get right with God, so that depression stays. 
So your chemical levels in your brain start changing because you didn't fix the problem. So then you go to the doctor and he says, you've got a chemical imbalance in your head because you've been doing the stupid thing. <laughs> it's a cycle. So how do you do it? Well, you stop doing the stupid thing for one. <laughs> Don't be so self-centered. That bring, that, that's, our, that's our next point here. For St. Timothy, uh, chapter 3. Now, I'm not saying every case of depression. Depression comes from many different things. Um, sometimes from birth. Sometimes from traumatic experiences like death. Uh, really from a lot of different things. It doesn't show necessarily, doesn't necessarily show um, any kind of sin in life. Sometimes it does, but not always. Um, I always say to people who... Um, are obviously having problems but refuse to face it. I always say, you know, everybody everybody has depression. Just not everybody knows that they do. You know, have you never stayed up late at night thinking, worrying about something? Have you never uh, lost sleep? Have you ever worried yourself sick about death? About the finality of it all? Have you never sat and thought, what point is it to do anything at all? It will just go away when I die anyways. Haven't you ever thought those things? The writer of Ecclesiastes did. Um, okay, so Second Timothy three one through four, but realize this: that in the last times, difficult times will come. Why? Why are difficult times going to come? For men will be lovers of self, ah, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irrecon ir irreconcilable. We had this thing unteachable. I think that's like that irreconcilable. Malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, t uh, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied his power, avoid such men as these. That's another way you can tell if you're going backwards, if you're headed to bad things tomorrow. So that leads us to, to the next point. I think we're on five now. One, two, three, four, five. Living in passions. Now, what is a passion? Passion is basically like a pleasure. Um, it's like things that may have technically been good once upon a time, but you're just kind of wallowing in it. Let me give you an example. Sex in the confines of marriage is a good thing. Well, then we take that and we make it not a good thing. Sex out of marriage. Looking at pornography. Uh, I mean, go down the list of all the different things. A good thing that was turned bad, and then you kind of just, there's no bounds to it. There's no, there's no law to it. It's just lawlessness, complete chaos. That's the pleasures of, of the world. Um, money. Money is, a, money is a fairly good thing. I mean, we use it to do a lot of good things. If we didn't have money, programs like BGMC wouldn't exist. Missionaries wouldn't get the funding that they needed. And money, money is a very good thing. But the love of money is a root of all sorts of different kinds of evils. See what I mean? So that's kind of Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Actually has something to talk and something to say about this. It says in verse 19 through 25. Now the deeds of flesh are evident with the passions of uh, the, the passions I was talking about, which are immorality. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. In other words, this is not an exhaustive list, but you kind of get the idea of what I'm saying. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have previously forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And then if you look back in verse 18, it says this, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Do you know what that means? That means that if you do not live according to the Spirit... Roll with me on this, okay? If, if you do not live according to the Spirit, you are subject to the law. Everyone is under one of two things. They're either under grace, by accepting Christ, 
and walking according to his ways, or they do not accept Christ and they do not walk, walk according to his ways and they are under the law. And if they are under the law, then they are condemned as a law breaker. See, the law isn't in effect anymore for us, but the law is still in effect for law breakers. See, for us, the law has been set aside. But for those who don't accept Jesus, why would the law have been set aside? See what I mean? And so what people try to do is they try to live according to the law when they've got grace. They try to follow the commands of the Old Testament when they're no longer under the law. Or they pick and choose. I like this one. This one I don't understand. This one I do. You see it with a lot of different, oh my goodness, a lot of different things. You see it with the Sabbath, you know, this whole seventh day, still needing to practice it. You see it with um, the tattoos. You see it with I mean, go down the list. These are all the things I understand in the law, so I'm going to keep them. But then there's all these things over here that I don't understand the law, so I'm not going to keep those things. But if you're under grace, you're no longer under the law. So what I see is I see a lot of people who don't live under grace. They live under lawlessness and then assume that they are no, lo no longer under the law. Well, I'm saved, so I can do whatever I want. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> and if you are living however you want, then you're actually under the law. Pretty confusing. But then when you actually stop to think about it, no, not really. It kind of makes sense. So, living in your passion. So let's look down the list that we've had so far. Go to the previous slide there, buddy. So far, we have refusing to listen, thinking you're better, refusing help, self-centered, living in pleasures. These are signs that you're going to fall away. These are warning signs. They're, they're, they're preemptive flags that are waving in your life saying, hey, I'm in need of God to change me because I'm getting pretty hard. That kind of make sense? So go ahead and go to the next slide there, buddy. Um, if we are not living by the Spirit, we are still under the law. Really, really important point there. So now uh, that brings us to the next thing. Go to the next slide there. And the next slide, the next point there is bitterness. Bitterness. The inability to forgive someone, the holding on to a wrong suffered, the, uh, I mean, I don't know how else you can say it, um, the anger with someone that doesn't go away after just five seconds. The, <laughs> the bad thoughts that you wish on someone. I mean, I don't know how else to define this. If you don't think that you're bitter, and yet you can't think of anything good to say about someone, you're wrong. In fact, I think it was, yeah, Chuck has this test that he gave to his, to his youth group. He said, when you can see the person in Walmart and your stomach doesn't go, you know you're good. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I, I still quote that thing. It's been like, I think, three or four years since he said it. Anyways, um, bitterness. It, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says this very, very, uh, what's the word, poignant uh, warning. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. You know, every time I see somebody leave the church, it's always, A, somebody else's fault. Oh, well, they, they did this, or they did this, or they did that. And they always make a fuss before they leave. I never see anybody leave because I don't believe in the Bible, and they believe in the Bible. So I guess I'm just going to go ahead and go out. It's always, well, they're just, you know, brr, 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 and then they, you know, go out to, and they say all kinds of stuff that's just not true. <laughs> I don't know what to do here, guys. Um, and it's that idea that that bitterness comes up and it just destroys people, doesn't it? Right? Well, you don't know how much that person who left that gossiped about me, you don't know how much that hurt me as a pastor. People don't change. There's the bitterness. When I'm convinced that people don't change because that person hurt me, I'm convinced that people don't change because I'm irritated with someone. So then another, another thing that we see as, a, as kind of a warning sign, I go to the next point there, buddy. Pulling out of ministry or leaving ministry or church or others. 
when your life no longer revolves around anyone but yourself and what you want to do. The thing about getting involved in churches, you, you know sometimes churches, sometimes churches take advantage of people. Did you know that? Sometimes they overwork them. Sometimes they expect too much from too few. Things like that can happen. Because people make mistakes, right? It happens. But if you don't spend your time doing good, you will spend it doing something else. You know, I've never once seen a husband cheat on his wife while he was helping out in a ministry at a church. You know, I've never seen that. Do you know why? Because he was doing something better with his time. You will find something to fill your time up with. You can either pick good things or you can pick bad things, but the time will pass no matter what. For instance, you can sit your time, spend your time sitting on your butt all day. This is called laziness, very much discouraged by, in the Bible. Then there's something else that people do, the overworking, never being able to take a break. This is something God strongly warned against. He even made a special day of it called the Sabbath for just such an occasion <laughs> to teach people to chill out every once in a while. <laughs> um, you know, we think we're so important, we think we're so busy, and this is God's, you know, ace in the hole. Even I took a day off. Your move. Maybe I should. Um, anyways, um, pull, this idea of pulling out of ministry, pulling out of church, pulling out of others, you know, you, you don't have time for that kind of stuff, you have time for something else. Isn't it funny how those things always come up on the days that you should have been in fellowship? And here's the thing, if you let something take the time of service, there will always be something to take the time of service. Did you know that? Surprising thing, I don't know how it works, but it can be Monday morning, nothing to do. Tuesday evening, nothing to do. Wednesday night around seven o'clock, wouldn't you know my son's car broke down, I had to go to El Paso to pick him up? Wouldn't you know it? Imagine that. Who knew? Um, anyways, um, but then there's this other little little warning that is probably one of the strongest ones on this list. And that's the last one I'm going to mention. Not reading your Bible and not, not praying. Forsaking these things, the spiritual disciplines which are so important. And, and why, why is that such an important thing? Well, if you turn over to Psalm 119, you don't have to. But I highly encourage you to memorize this, this verse. It's something that I myself have memorized. Psalm 119. Starting in verse, I don't know what verse it's in, but I know it's there. Verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? How can I not do the wrong thing? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Very important stuff here. You know, my, my, old, my old pastor used to tell me this, not me, but I mean, he used to say it a lot. He used to say, this book will either keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And I found that that is the way it goes. If you're not staying in the Word, you're going to find yourself doing stupid things. If you are staying in the Word, you'll slowly start seeing, seeing victory. But you know something that God told Israel while they were going to the Promised Land? He told them this, I'm not going to give you victory all at once. But little bit by little bit. And you know that God still does that in us too? He doesn't give us victory all at once. Little bit by little bit. For those of you who think that God has given you complete victory and you have nowhere else to go, you've reached the sky, remember that John says, if anyone says that he is no longer with sin, he is a liar. So don't forget that. Um, okay, so there's three very simple stages that I want to look at. The first is the three stages of sin. That This is how you get into sin. And once again, I'm go to the next point there, buddy. I'm focusing on things to help you to not fall away from seeking God. So the first three things are the three stages of sin. First off is a fight against your conscience. Where you... You're unsure, or maybe you do know that you shouldn't be doing this, but you kind of do it anyways. And you're like, well, maybe I shouldn't have. And you know, it kind of bothers you in here. The guilt. You know maybe something's not right. 
Then that takes us to the second, um, second stage if you don't listen to that. And that's seeking to justify that guilt. Because we as people hate pain. And when it's self-caused pain, then we just feel all kinds of stupid. So we will do anything but admit that we are wrong and change the problem. We will literally shoot ourselves in the foot and then say, give me Tylenol because I shot myself in the foot. <laughs> we will do anything so we do not have to admit that we are wrong. But that will still only lead us into further death, which leads us to the final stage of sin, living boldly in it. This is where people can't tell you anything about it because this is just what I'm going to do. Well, the Bible says this. I don't care. I'm going to live however I want. It's my, it's my, my life. My, my. See what I mean? Oftentimes, somewhere in between this stage and seeking to justify, they'll, they'll pull scriptures out of like nowhere that have nothing to do with what they're talking about to try and justify what they're talking about. Make sure that you use this for its intended purposes. Have you ever gotten a bazooka and pointed it at the ground and shot? Well, you probably shouldn't do that with this either. It's not meant for self-harm. So that leads us to the next three stages. Go to the next point there, buddy. These are the three stages of freedom, for lack of a better word, or three stages of victory, or three stages of getting over a sin. The first stage is, is the word. When you start reading the Bible, God starts showing you things. But it doesn't stop there. And this is, once again, something that doesn't happen overnight. This is a process. Maybe you'll read the Bible for two or three years before God starts showing you things. The point is, read it every day and delve into it. And then you eventually get to the second stage, which is kind of wrapped up in that stage, prayer. See, at first when you start praying, it looks something like this. God, thank you for this day. Amen. Or... You know, uh, God, thank you for this food. Now you're me down to sleep, amen. I don't know, whatever. Everybody's different. But then eventually you actually start having meaningful prayers. These are where you go past that into things that are actually like you're communicating with God. And then there's a sweet spot right after there where it's like when you go to prayer, you're walking into the presence of God every time. And the problem is, is that oftentimes we don't make it to that point because we give up praying somewhere before that. We, see, we include it in our, as a ritual in our life. We do it for our five minutes, and usually it's somewhere in the middle of the day, sometimes in the morning. Um, and, and then, well, that didn't work. Notice the me-centered self. That, that didn't work. How does prayer not work? It's talking to God. I mean, it only didn't work if you didn't do it. I mean, it's a very simple process. I mean, <laughs> I think sometimes we overcomplicate things to make ourselves feel more spiritual. And I don't think, I think sometimes pastors do it too. You know, we'll, we'll give these real complicated messages and we'll pat ourselves on the back. Ha, ha, ha. I really know what I'm talking about. And then, you know, you talk to somebody like, I don't know what you're talking about. <coughs> no. Okay. Which brings us to the third stage of freedom. Discipline. Ooh. This is, the pain, this is where it starts getting painful. Because here's the three ways, that, the three different things that God uses discipline. Directly. He directly speaks to us and tells us that we're doing something wrong. But here's the problem. He doesn't always do that. He tends to lean to these other two ways. From others. Oh. You mean that really, really annoying person I can actually learn something from? Oh. Or the third way, from situations. Oh, God forbid, don't let it be. Yes, it is. Do you notice how when there are no problems, you know, you kind of do your own thing, you're like, okay, I'm good. And then a problem comes by, and yeah, there's something that they tell you in psychology, it's called fight or flight. When there's a problem, you know, your brain either tells you to, to stand firm or you just bolt. And that's kind of what we do when God brings a trial by. We have that moment at the beginning to decide, are you gonna stand firm or are you gonna bolt? <laughs> Uh, and anyways, those are the three stages of getting out of getting out of getting out of sin, get, getting to a new life. And the thing is, you can't run from it. You can't run from it. Those are the only ways to grow, and those are the only ways ways to mature. Stay in the Word, stay in prayer, and submit to the discipline. Because God will just keep bringing it by. Guys, it's not like the McDonald's win drive-through where you just drive away. You can't do that. These, these McDonald's customers are 
painful. They'll follow you down and say, I've got your fries, sir. You need to take them. You know, oh, no, no, no. A better analogy is the, uh, the, the credit card companies, right? They're calling you all the time. <laughs> I swear I paid that one off. Uh, similar with it, if you've ever been to the hospital, even if, even if your insurance covered it, they'll still hound you for the bill. You owe us $40,000. No, I, I, swear, I swear I'm not lying. The insurance paid it. Sure, they did. We hear that all the time, but they did. Pay attention to those three things. The word, prayer, and discipline, because it will directly counteract the other, the three stages of sin. Fight conscience, seek to justify, live boldly. If I'm living boldly in a sin, and I'm doing these other three stages, reading the word, praying, and, and submitting to discipline, I won't be living, in, living boldly in a sin anymore. I'll be convicted, and I'll change, because the Holy Spirit will work in me, and, I, and he'll change me. If I'm in the second stage, seeking to justify, I won't seek to justify because the Holy Spirit will remind me of the words that I've been reading in his word. Okay? So what about the first one, the fight against the conscience? It's the Holy Spirit who puts our conscience in place in the first place. So when something comes by that we'll just know, that's wrong. Even if it's not necessarily wrong, that's not for you. You know, alcoholism runs in my family. And a lot of time people, times people, Christians mostly would argue with me, drinking alcohol is not bad. In small amounts, it's actually good for you. And I said, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Really, it is. But alcoholism runs in my family, and I don't think that's very smart. Even if it didn't, I don't feel like it's very smart if you're planning on doing any kind of ministry to be drinking alcohol because we deal with a lot of alcoholics. Hey, you, you need to stop drinking now. Give me to me when you're done with it, because, you know, you shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it. Well, how well do you think that's going to float? You see what I mean? We, we, we can't do that. But in other news, before I go to in closing, you can go to the next point. They did a recent study, and you know what they found out? That alcohol is not safe for you in any amount. Ha! I was right all those years that they mocked me. They made fun of me. They said, no, a little bit helps. But no, they actually did a study and it found out that the damage it does is worse than any benefits that it gives you. Booyah! I knew I was right. <laughs> when you stand on faith in something, even though everybody tells you you're wrong, you're like, <laughs> I'm right. Anyways, uh, so in conclusion, how can we ensure that we are on the right path? Is it, you know, besides all these little warning signs, is there something more definite you know there is? Now this I really do want you to turn to. This is in 2 Peter. Now, if you've come at all on Wednesday nights, you've already heard Pastor read it about 30 times. It's a very, very important part for what he's been talking about. But if you haven't been coming to Wednesday nights, I really, really, really want you to open your Bibles and read this with me. Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you and the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Verse 4. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Translation. God's going to do a work in you. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, verse 5, for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. Verse 7, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Verse 8, and this is the one I want you to... If you memorize scripture, I really, really, really would like you to memorize this one. If you don't, I would highly recommend that you start memorizing it. And people always tell me I can't memorize anything. What's your name? <laughs> Where do you live? You memorize something. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours. Now, now listen to this. If these qualities are yours and are increasing. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the phrase I really want you to remember, are yours and are increasing. We can be changed, and we can be warned before we stop changing. 
And so I want you to remember that if they are yours and are increasing. So that brings us to go ahead and go to that, that point there, buddy. The next one. What about them? Can God change them? Are they ever going to change? This is spiritual insight that I have gained through, through special prayer and meditation. Mind your own business. Let God do with them what he's going to do with them, and you allow yourself to be changed. See, we like to fix everybody else's problem. God wants us to submit our problems. In fact, there was this guy in the Bible that said something very similar. His name was Peter. He said, but Jesus, what about John? What are you going to do about him? And you know what Jesus said to him? Exactly what I just told you. Mind your own business. What does that have anything to do with you what I'm going to do with him? <laughs> And that is something I would like to encourage you. Do you ever get in that place where you just get really whiny and, and just negative and say, people don't ever change. God's never going to change, and they're never going to they're never going to stop doing that stupid thing. Mind your own business. Let God do what he's going to do in them. You pray for them, and you let it go because it's none of your business. Instead, you submit yourself to God and let God change you. And if you don't think that you need to be changed, that's just further proof of how much you do need to be changed. Now, I'm speaking from experience because this is something that I thought for a long time. You know, I went through a five-year dry spell of thinking that I was God's gift to the world and I had no problems because I truly conquered everybody else and all the problems. Well, I was wrong. Did you know that? It took me five years to realize that. And if you think so, guess what? You're wrong too. You can join in my foolishness or you can join in my wisdom. And so that leaves nothing more but a question for ourselves. And I want you to ask yourself this. Do I want to be changed and live God's way, which is hard? Or do I want to not change and do things my way? If you keep doing the same thing today, tomorrow you'll get the same results. Think of it kind of like a plant. Let's say... Every day you go out and you pick all the leaves off of the tree. The next day, if it has any new, you go out there and you pick them out again. And you do this every single day. And then, come at the end of, you know, fall, you say, how? How come there's no leaves turning yellow and falling on the ground? Like, I really like it when leaves turn yellow and fall. Why aren't they doing that? See, we can't get surprised at the results that we yield from what we do. You know how many people I see work out for five days and then they're surprised that they haven't lost any weight? I see this all the time. Now, I'm talking about something more important than exercising. I'm talking about our spiritual life. You can't do five minutes of labor and get five years of labor result. It's not going to work like that. So be on your guard because this is something that I want you to remember. Tuck it away in your brain. Besides, people can't change which is really the highlight of all this, anyone can fall. I bet you in this very room, even as I was talking, some of you were probably saying in your head, that'll never happen to me. Be on your guard, because pride, pride's not good. Anyone can fall. Anyone. I've seen pastors fall. I've seen people who've been in the church for years fall. Anyone can fall. Anyone can fall. Well, surely not, not this person. Yes, that person. Well, surely not that person. Yes, that person too. Anyone can fall. You know who the only person is who can't fall? Jesus. That's the only one. So, we're all good with that. People do change, and you can't change. And if you're worrying about somebody else not changing, mind your own business. That's the highlights of everything we talked about, right? Okay, good. Okay, so if you'll join me. Lord, I pray that you continue to work in us. Help us to be on our guard. Because the work that the enemy does to destroy us is usually a conniving, long-planned, manipulative, long-term scheme to get us to fall. Very, very rarely does he ever fool us overnight. He plants little seeds. And those little seeds become weeds. And those little weeds turn into really, really tall weeds that make it hard for us to even walk through. Lord, so help us to be on our guard. Help us to pay attention and to be smarter than that.
Lord, I pray you'd help us to change and help us to not worry about whether or not someone else is going to change. Lord, do the work in us that you know needs to be done. And help us to continue to grow and continue to press forward. We don't want to be in the same boat tomorrow as we are in today. And we certainly don't want to be in the same boat that we were in 20 years ago tomorrow. Lord, move us forward. We want to grow. We want to learn. We want to be closer to you. We want to be made more like you. Even if it's painful, God, help us to learn to follow you. I love you. Amen.